Once again, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. I have probably spoken with quite a few of you before, um, either in the channels or in the community calls. Um, but uh, first of all, congratulations to everyone who's made it this far in the Shipyard Academy. We hope you've enjoyed the program so far. We hope you've learned a lot. Um, the past few weeks have been, you know, a, a real deep dive, right? It's been a real deep dive into NIM technologies, into the kind of full architecture, into the token economics, um, the difference between the mixed net and the, and the blockchain. Um, so this final stage is really about, you know, now that now we kind of assume that you understand the basics of the system itself. And so I think with this lecture and the lecture that's going to happen next week with our CEO, Harry Halpin, we want to kind of zoom out a little bit. Um, you have some echo. Okay, give me one second. Let me see what I can do about that. Hang on. Right, how's this? Is this better? Great, okay, I'll continue. Um, yeah, so in this lecture, uh, I want to kind of take a step out and or zoom out onto the kind of bigger picture of, you know, why privacy is important, um, not in a kind of vague sense, but to get a little bit more specific about, uh, you know, the role of privacy technologies as we move forward um, in, you know, in society in general. Um, and this partially builds also on my profile. So as many of you might not know, I don't come originally from a tech background. My background is always been kind of more or less around tech, but um, it's been focused more on questions of power and questions of society, social dynamics, power dynamics within society, um, you know, how, how society kind of evolves and develops. Um, and because, you know, technology really is at the core and at the center of power dynamics in contemporary society, that has become, you know, increasingly my main focus until, you know, I'm, I recently joined uh, NIM. NIM is not the first technology company I'm working with, but it's definitely kind of uh, the first where I have both feet in the actual company, so to speak. So my background is uh in terms of my in terms of discipline it's in digital geography so i look at you know the intersection of politics um economics and space and here i'm talking about digital space in particular and how digital space and digital technologies change dynamics of power um next slide uh pseudo so yeah, so this is me, this is the introduction. Um, what I wanted to do in this talk is to first talk a little bit about what is specific about mass surveillance. So what is the kind of, what is new about the type of surveillance paradigm that we, that we live in um, in contemporary society and to understand how privacy is an actual intervention into uh, new dynamics of surveillance and how privacy can, is not just a kind of defense um, from mass surveillance, but in fact can reshape the future direction of innovation going forward. Um, and then I would like to end off with kind of, uh, you know, some curveballs that look at, you know, how the privacy debate is going to change over the next few years, um, in my mind. And I would love to hear people's comments about that as well. Uh, next slide, Sudo. So first, I am going to um, focus on, first, I'm going to say a few things that are, uh, you know, perhaps fairly obvious to this audience, um, but just to reemphasize just how important, you know, data and the data market is um, in the global economy right now. You know, we're looking at, you know, this, this was a kind of estimate from Statista that was looking at numbers from, um, from, uh, uh, 2018, where, you know, they measured it to be worth 169 billion US dollars um, and expected it to grow to 274 billion US dollars. And so, you know, this is really just to emphasize just how important data is in, in the current economy. Um, next slide, Sudo. And of course, the question is, you know, how much of that data is actual surveillance, right? How much of that data is um, harvested and extracted uh, without people's consent involuntarily and through automated processes? Next slide, Sudo. Um, so this kind of this new paradigm, you know, which is a kind of paradigm of, you know, it's been called many different things. It's been called, you know, uh, the era of big data, it's, and most famously it's been called surveillance capitalism. 
to really capture the way that surveillance is, you know, not just something that is done by, you know, a few spy agencies here and there, but it's really been integrated into the core of of uh, our economy today. And so when Shoshana Zuboff wrote this book uh, titled Surveillance Capitalism, it was in 2019. And I think this was right around the time, you know, just a few early years earlier, some of the biggest companies in the world, you know, the com- largest companies in terms of market capitalization were technology companies. And most of those or a lot of those were driven by, you know, ad tech and and uh, uh, data extractive um, economics. And that includes, of course, Google. This was when the kind of the 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 name GAFA came about. So you had, you know, to to talk about uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. Oftentimes Alibaba and Microsoft was added to that too. But these were really like the, you know, gigantic companies um, that we're now so used to. Uh, So when Shoshana wrote this book, this was really to emphasize that the nature of surveillance has changed, right? It's become a kind of integral part of the economic dynamics in society. Um, I also mentioned here at the end that, you know, that's slightly the dynamics here are changing a little bit. Again, if we start to look at market capitalization of companies today, you know, big oil and and logistics is definitely back. Um, So it's just to say it's not just tech that's dominating in the economics right now. Um, But uh, the data industry and and technology companies still are, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, Next slide, Sudo. So... What I really want to emphasize here is that when you know this shift from surveillance being something where you know we can think of it in terms of like it, you know it used to be something where you'd have some person that was under suspicion and then that person would be watched, right? Um, what's happening now is that instead of a single a person or you know being in, being under under suspicion and therefore being watched, you have you have almost the inverse happening. You have everybody being watched in order to surface who is starting to look suspicious, right? Um, and this is a kind of new era of of mass surveillance. And what I want to emphasize here um, is a little bit of media theory uh, to uh, to start to understand that you know what matters is not just you know that someone is being watched, but exactly how they're being watched. Because how they're being watched change what becomes possible with you know the the medium itself, um, and so here I kind of mention a few authors that if anyone wants to kind of do a bit of a theoretical deep dive, um, Marshall McLuhan is famously the person that said the medium is the message to really emphasize that it's not just what we do, it's how we do things that shapes the conditions of of our society and the, sh- the conditions of of power dynamics. Um, I also list Benjamin Ruha, who who raised uh, the way that new types of technologies, um, you know, and especially in, in the kind of data era of data and algorithms, uh, emphasize you know existing inequalities. Um, there's Lana Schwartz, who takes a specific media theory approach to understand you know money and the shift from uh, analog money to digital money. So what does this new medium of money make possible? Um, Louisa Moore, who looks at cloud geographies, so the geographies of data centers and how, you know, data centers that operate across the world enable new types of power dynamics to emerge. Got Jenna Burrell, who looks at the entire data pipeline, so we can start to understand how, you know, surveillance and privacy is not just a question of, um, uh, a question of, like, am I being watched by the NSA, but it's, a, it's in fact an entire industry, right? So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then James Gibson, who's another kind of old school media theorist who talks about something called affordance theory. And I find this a very useful way to think about technologies, which is, you know, to not just think about how the technology, you know, what the technology does, but in, in fact, what the technology makes makes possible. So, you know, what is the difference when we think about when we think about knowledge and information? What is the difference between, you know, reading a book or having, you know, data on a, in a data center, right? It's like it's both forms of information, but those two forms of information make completely different processes possible, right? Um, so thinking a little bit about the, the meaning of the medium here. Um, and then finally, Salome uh, Viljoen, who I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, um, who speaks about relational data governance. And we're going to go into that a little bit more. Um, next slide, Sudo. So um, uh, Salome's uh, concept of relational data governance is very important to understand what is the difference between surveillance and mass surveillance. 
So, and the, the primary difference is that mass surveillance is fundamentally collective and it's fundamentally relational. So the reason why it's interesting, the reason, the reason why data and big data is valuable is because of the relationships that it, it surfaces, the relationships that it makes visible. So it's not just about what one single person is up to. It is about, you know, a kind of, you know, generic, it's about pro creating new profiles of new groups of people. It's about understanding new social dynamics. It's about understanding changing norms. Um, and that kind of analysis is a collective analysis. Um, and to come back to the core of it and, and to come back to the beginning of mass surveillance, which was in fact, you know, as Shoshana points out, a collaboration between the surveillance apparatus of the United States, or sorry, between the, the security agencies in the United States and big tech industry, you know, this was a kind of marriage between the NSA and Google, let's say. Um, General Keith Alexander from the NSA said, you need the haystack to find the needle, the needle, right? So what does he mean by this? He means that in order to understand who is suspicious in the first place, you have to understand what the norm is. Um, and in order to understand what the norm is, you need a s statistical mass, right? So you need a lot of data points so that you can do the analysis to understand what are the types of, you know, what are the types of dynamics that we're, we're seeing here? Um, what behaviors can we group into new types of profiles? What can we learn about those profiles? How do they relate to other types of profiles? Um, can we make predictions about them by calculating uh, about their behavior at a st statistical level, so at an aggregate level, right? So this is really the difference between surveillance, where you're focusing on, on, on you know, the suspicious behavior of one individual, and mass surveillance, where you're talking about an entire population. Um, next slide, Sudo. Um, so to get to Salome's uh, relational theory of data governance, um, you know, this, this really goes into depth about, you know, what does that, what, what's the importance here? What does that mean for power dynamics, right? When we're talking about the difference between surveillance and mass surveillance. So typically speaking, um, people tend to think about surveillance like this, that there is a data processor, you know, there's someone who kind of is gathering a bunch of data about you, um, and there's a data subject, that's you, right? And then the whole question that people tend to kind of try and work out is like, have you consented to your data being used by this data processor, right? So it's very much about the individual and it's very much about individual consent and individual choice. Um, to say whether or not they want to have data about them produced and um, what that data should be used for and who that data should be shared with, right? So this is how we tend to typically think about um, uh, privacy and surveillance. Uh, pseudo? Um, thanks. What Salome uh, wants to emphasize is that there's another axis here that we have to pay attention to. Um, we have to look at not just the data processor and the individual, but we have to understand how what happens, you know, when the data, when the individual consents to having their data used, who does that go on to affect, right? So what we see here on the left side is the data subject, right? You're having data produced about you and you say, cool, yeah, go ahead and use that data. Um, the data processing that then happens means your data gets fed into, you know, a data pool that gets analyzed, you know, sold on by data brokers that gets used for training machine, lear uh, machine learning algorithms, which then go on to be used to uh, profile and target other people elsewhere. So here we're looking at the relationship between data subject A and other types of data subject A's, meaning other people uh, that are within the same group profile. So you know, the, the ability to, to uh, or, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sudo, next slide. Um, but there is even more that happens here. It's not just that data subject A, uh, you know, becomes part of informing a group profile of other people with the same uh, types of characteristics, but also if we look at the entire, you know, data industry pipeline, you know, data subject A can also go on to feed machine learning algorithms that get used on completely different subjects, right? So the example that Salome uh, uses here is an example where geolocation data used in an app um, by a bunch of people for a game, I think it was Pokemon Go or something like this, um, you know, then goes on to be so, you know, the kind of the, 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 the analysis of the movements of people as they're going about, you know, looking for Pokemons and whatever else goes on to be sold to in a, uh, for a kind of uh, an, an application that people were going to, uh, border police were going to be used in order to um, uh, 
uh, analyze when there's like suspect um, suspicious movement happening around the border to see whether there's illegal immigrants ca crossing a border, right? So we're here we're talking about two completely different contexts, two completely different groups of people. Um, but the data on of of one goes on to you know severely affect the data of other people. Um, next slide, Sudo. Um, so what we're talking about here is um, wait, is there a slide that's missing? Hang on, maybe. Yeah, no. Um, so when we're talking about this relationship between you know data subject A and data subject B. We're talking about a full data industry pipeline, right? As I explained, so it's like it's you know we we're talking we're talking about you know the app on your phone all the way through to you know uh, thousands of data brokers that sell this on to you know both the the public uh, sector and the private sector that use this for you know everything from research projects and some of these some of these things are are you know interesting and worthwhile, right? So it can be for medical research, but it can also be for um, uh, you know automated uh, policing um, and uh, and and worse right drones uh, drone systems and so on so you know this is we're talking about a very big industry and we're talking about data traces that are actually like super super complex um but i think the key point that i'd like to make here is that you know when we're talking about the data industry we're talking about 274 billion us dollar pressure to continue surveillance right to continue surveilling and this is this is what what shoshana tries to emphasize when she's saying surveillance capitalism this is really there's a huge economic pressure to continue these types of practices. Go on, Sudo. Um, so to kind of come back to uh, you know the the point here, when we think about privacy today, there tends to be kind of two ways that people want to kind of like solve this problem of surveillance, right? The first is through consent, um, and I think we've all seen the kind of like you know the, the cookie uh, cookie settings, which tends to annoy most people. Um, and here the the idea is that you know you you as an individual have you know you can get you get to decide whether to share your data or not. And okay, cookie settings are are super horrible, but we're seeing other projects that want to try and make that even better. But the point when I think that Salome is making when we're looking at the the kind of collective question of surveillance is that it actually doesn't matter <laughs> if the individual opts in or out. Um, because you're just a tiny data point, right? Um, in you know thousands of other data points. So if you have like a thousand other people that are willingly handing their data over, then you choosing not to makes a makes very little difference to the industry as a whole, and makes very little difference to the consequences of the industry as a whole. Um, the second approach that we tend to see when it comes to this individual uh idea of privacy is like oh but you know okay you have you have a an extractivist industry that's making money out of your data we should allow individuals to make money off of their own data but again the point that salome is making here is that the value of data is not individual the value of data is exactly in the collective nature in its ability to tell us things about the the aggregate level about entire populations about groups of people it, it allows us to create new profiles and understand new behaviors um and you know even if you could get uh, some money off of your data you know people have done some calculations and it's it's uh, less than pennies yeah i mean it's data worth of, you know your individual uh, personal data is worth um less than than a, a dollar cent uh next slide Sudo. Um, this is just an example of, uh, you know, this, this idea of personal consent and personal control. Um, I tried to do the experiment of, uh, copying over every single, uh, this is like less than a day's worth of cookie settings. <laughs> so I think in fact, this might just be from one website alone. Um, you know, you could literally go in and, uh, and you'd have to kind of set, you know, read each and every company and kind of change the settings for each and every company, um, which, you know, as a researcher is super fascinating. I think, you know, in that sense, the, the GDPR from the European Union has been successful. We can actually see how crazy this industry is now. But in terms of empowering us to make decisions about our data as we go about our digital lives, it's uh it's underwhelming to say the least in fact it is um it's it's a horrible experience and it makes zero sense whatsoever um but yeah you're 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 welcome to go in and just check all these companies because when you start to understand just how big the data broker industry is you can start to get a sense of you know how much interest there is at stake in continuing the surveillance practices that currently exist online um next slide too. <clears throat> 
Um, so just to sum summarize this section, uh, the point that Salome is making here, which I think is a very valid point, is that data is relational. It operates, you know, when we're talking about mass surveillance, we're talking about population level um, surveillance. And so when we say things like privacy by default, we don't just mean this as a slogan, but we mean this really as a kind of collective blockade on the surveillance paradigm, right? Um, and, you know, which means that, you know, when you have privacy as the default, you have the privacy, you have, you have blanket privacy as a starting point, then you can start to have, you know, a society that can make meaningful choices around um, who produces data, when and for what. Um, and I would argue that, in fact, you know, privacy in that sense uh, gives rise to a kind of an entirely new innovation paradigm. Next slide, Sudo. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, we could go into this, but this is basically just to say, to let's skip this slide. I want to get to the industrial parts, actually, move on. Um, this is just a bunch of marketing slogans. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the point here is that um, privacy does give rise to a, a new type of innovation paradigm. And I think people are starting to get a sense of that. We haven't quite reached hype factor yet, but I reckon we can probably do that in the next year. I think people are going to start to really understand um, what can be done in this industry. And so, and here we've got Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures uh, talking about how, you know, uh, the importance of privacy um, in reaction to, you know, not just, you know, the mass surveillance that was revealed by Edward Snowden back then, but um, also new, new conditions like COVID-19 and so on. People are starting to kind of feel um, the consequences of surveillance uh, a lot more um, viscerally right we can feel it on our bodies we can feel it you know we have chelsea in, in our team who talks a lot about the mental health uh consequences of of surveillance um because i think the important thing to understand with, with surveillance is that it is behind the the kind of ad tech industry as well and so this is literally a, a competition for for your attention a competition for your mind space a competition for your brain right um so it's uh, you know we can see here fred wilson um jumping on on board with the idea that privacy is uh is it's the next paradigm essentially next slide pseudo um so let's go into just a little bit how it is potentially the the next paradigm right so this kind of visual that we've got here is, is like one of those kind of classic woo woo visuals around artificial intelligence right it's like is the brain a computer and so on which um personally it's uh, i think is totally bullshit but there is you know there is a, a growing artificial intelligence industry that is, you know, at the other end of the pipeline, right? So if we're if we're talking when we're talking about surveillance and privacy, we're talking about, you know, who gets to kind of produce data and gather data about people. Well, that data goes on to inform um, machine learning algorithms elsewhere that go on to affect uh, other people elsewhere, as we were discussing with Salome's relational data governance paradigm. Um, so what happens when you kind of intervene, right? What happens when you intervene and, and establish privacy as the defa default privacy as the kind of baseline of everybody's devices and applications? Um, well, first of all, we can start talking meaningfully about the idea of data sovereignty, right? So it, it means that we can start making meaningful decisions, not just at the individual level, but at societal level. We can start to decide what should actually be turned into data because once you turn something into data, it becomes something that can be exploited for machine learning algorithms or something, you know, or otherwise. So it's it, it's a it's a unique form of information, a unique form of knowledge, right? Um, so it also enables uh, knowledge sovereignty, right? And and when we're talking about data, we're not just talking about you know anything here. We're talking about the things that matter to people. So what you know, making the decision about what it is that matters in the first place. Um, when we're when we're feeding machine learning algorithms data sets, what is it that we're actually feeding them? Um, you know, this is the production of a new form of knowledge and making the decisions about what it is that matters in society, what problems we want to solve, um, and what matters for various people at various points in time. Like this is, you know, connected to you know having privacy as the baseline. Then you can make these these meaningful decisions. Um, which then also leads to to technological sovereignty because when we're talking about um you know the ability to exploit data for new types of innovation um that is you know a question of like who ha you know who who has control over the the future direction that technological innovation should go in and here i i put a link to um some people who have kind of worked on this um intellectually quite well so this is around the concept of indigenous indigenous ai so they really think through, you know, what is the types of knowledge forms? Because 
think about the way that a lot of artificial intelligence is trained today. A lot of it is like literally data that's scraped from the internet, right? And that that data is is hugely uh, suspect. It's it's a lot of it is garbage, and a lot of it is non consensual. And there's a lot that could be done um, to actually improve uh, AI, improve artificial intelligence by um, making much more meaningful decisions around um, around data. And then finally, I wanted to point out also um, artist experiments in the in the area of AI. Um, you know, that also look at this question of small data sets and machine learning and what can you, you know, what happens when you start to train your own machine learning al algorithms. And I think like outside of industry, artists are some of the people that are that are starting to make kind of more meaningful sense of of what we can do um, when we start to take more control over data and, and how we want to kind of approach data rather than just see it as a big pool of information about the world. Um, data is not neutral. Data is always a decision about what it is that matters in the world. It's always a decision about um, uh, about um, what kind of information that, that is important for us to do the things that we're trying to do. Next slide, Sudo. Um, so uh, I would like to, this is the kind of third and, and final section of the talk. Um, I wanted to kind of throw in a little bit of a curveball here and talk a bit about um, how the future debates around privacy uh, are likely to shake, shape, shape up given the kind of uh, the, the, uh, the new technologies that are coming our way. So if we think that if we go back to the beginning, right, and we say, OK, so there's a there's a qualitative difference between surveillance and mass surveillance, right, because the technologies have changed. Um, we're talking about population level data. We're talking about entirely new processes that have given rise to entirely new industries. Um, now we have a new new set of tech. We have you know technology just does change quite rapidly, and what we're seeing um, on the horizon now is of course zero knowledge uh, cryptography. Do you, next slide, Sue. <coughs> um, is of course zero knowledge cryptography, and then we also have a whole industry around synthetic data. Um, so you know one thing that I'm interested in is mapping out you know how do these new technologies start to shift uh, the debate around privacy and surveillance. So. Um, and the reason why it's important to, to map that out is because just like, you know, I was saying our reaction to the, the mass surveillance paradigm is totally inadequate because we just simply have not updated our concept of what surveillance is. You know, we need to update it from being one that's concerned with the individual to one that's concerned with, with mass populations. Similarly, I think like now with the advent of zero knowledge and synthetic data, we're going to have to update our knowledge once again to understand, you know, how these technologies are going to uh, change the nature of the debate around privacy and surveillance. And to my mind, there is, you know, on one hand, these these two uh, two areas, they they open up an entirely new design space. So zero knowledge cryptography, um, the kind of quick and easy way to to uh, explain it is cryptography that is able to uh, verify, you know, prove and verify statements without revealing the underlying data, right? Um, and that can then allow for uh, you know, privacy preserving computation and so on and so forth. And synthetic data is an entirely new industry where people are creating data sets that are, they might have a little bit of initial data that's gathered from the real world, but otherwise they kind of extrapolate from there, right? Um, and, they, and the reason why synthetic data is becoming popular is because it's clean data, right? So it's data that is like very well organized. It's not kind of messy like the real world is. Um, and it also allows people to to kind of do things like correct for biases. So, um, so you see these two things starting to emerge. And from my perspective, what's going to happen with the debate is that these two uh, te technological and industrial developments are essentially going to privacy wash existing systems of control. Right. Um, so, uh, next slide, Sudo. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, we look here at the kind of uh, the vertical axis. We've got the kind of data producer. So, you know, the NSA or the evil company or whatever else. And then we've got the data subject that it, that is supposed to, you know, be where the the, the idea of choice is, right? The, the difference between pri between surveillance and, and just, uh, uh, let's say, data gathering is whether the subject has given their consent. Um, well, when it comes to zero knowledge and synthetic data, it's kind of almost as if, well, it solves the problem of, of privacy, right? So it's like zero knowledge cryptography, then it's like, well, nothing is revealed, so we can't talk about surveillance anymore. Um, we've solved the problem of privacy. Or 
with synthetic data, we're no longer talking about data about a specific individual. It is kind of, it's synthetic. And so therefore we're no longer talking about surveillance, right? So it's this idea of like getting rid of um, the, the data subject A, um, which means that the data processor, you know, the, the broker and so on, they can kind of deal with data in the same way as they used to. They can build the same systems as they were before. Everything remains the same, but we know we're no longer talking about surveillance. So from my perspective, next, the next slide, Sudo. So the, the way that we need to kind of evolve the conversation around um, privacy and surveillance, and the reason why I think Salome Viljon's uh, relational theory is so important for us to understand what's really going on here, is that, you know, we need to be able to articulate why and uh, why existing data practices um, around control, despite supposedly solving this problem of um, a privacy invasion of the individual, nevertheless uh, can have negative consequences, right? Because we, we see the exact sy same systems of control that were um, initially uh, enabled through surveillance continue to be enabled, even though the kind of the question of surveillance at the individual level has been has been resolved. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do around the kind of narrative. We have a lot of work to do around, you know, what is what is the kind of the basis of the conversation here um, to move it to a much more kind of a broader conversation about the 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 question of of mass surveillance, the question of the collective the nature of privacy and surveillance. Um, next slide, Sudo. Um, so that is to come back to you know our main slogan in him: privacy loves company. Uh, typically, you know, that refers to the question of the anonymity set, right? It has to do with, uh, it has to do with um, making sure that we have enough, enough data flowing through the mix net. Um, but there is actually a bigger meaning to this, this sentence as well, which is that privacy is something that needs to be resolved at the collective level, not just at the, at the individual level in order for it to be, um, in order for it to be effective. Um, we're talking about you know, massive imbalances of power here. We're talking about billions and billions of dollar industry versus the individual. We're talking about mass data sets versus the individual. Um, and so to balance that out, we need to have a collective approach to the question of privacy. So privacy loves company, not just for the anonymity set, not just because we'd like to have you all involved in shipyard, um, but because we actually need to have the collective involved. We need mass privacy to counter um, mass surveillance. So privacy loves company. Next slide, Sudo because surveillance does too, right? So we need, we need mass privacy in order to solve the, the problem of mass surveillance. Um, next slide, Sue, and I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Great talk. Thoroughly enjoyed it. We have a few questions. Cool. Although my phone is uh, incredibly slow, so uh, please bear with me until I find them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, question, is there any practice or resource uh, on methods <clears throat> of conscious creation of online disinformation in order to fuck these uh, models proper? Wait, uh, I, I think he's referring. So so uh, he's basically asking whether there's um, uh, there's a practice or a resource, a resource on methods of a conscious creation of online disinformation in order to uh, to mess up the models, which um, um, which um, which create the uh, the profiles of us. Totally. Yeah. Um, I actually, I can't think of any off the top of my head now, but I have, to, I've absolutely come across quite a few. Um, again, like, you know, there's some fantastic artists out there that are at the forefront of this. So I'll uh, make a note of that and I'll drop some links in the chat either later tonight or tomorrow. Thank you. Um, sorry, my phone is still very, very slow. I don't know why, but this chat is killing it. Oh, yeah, it's from Nick. It seems that it seems that to stop mass surveillance, we need a new monetization model instead of ads based uh, or targeted ads. But what would the alternatives be? Yeah, so that is such a good point. And it's in fact, one of the reasons why I work for NIM um, 100% because I am interested in the question of changing the business model, right? Because the business model is so much at the core of things. Um, and so, you know, right now, the kind of experiment that we're doing at NIM is obviously to, you know, to, to, to have a token, uh, token economics and a token economics that incentivizes privacy rather than surveillance. Um, that is, you know, uh, let's say a solution at the individual company level. And I think it's, it's something that's very much on the minds of a lot of privacy projects across the Web3 space.
Um, but I think as a kind of broader industrial norm, um, we still we're still lacking a little bit of a uh, we're lacking a little bit of a how to put it um, like a, a a hook there. So what I'm trying to do, you know, when I did the whole kind of piece of the talk that was talking about what privacy enables, there is a lot more work to do in that area, um, and there's a lot more work to do in terms of mapping out the business opportunities that go in a different direction than surveillance, right? Um, and that's where I want to kind of look at, you know, entirely new models for for data um, and what you know, a different way of, of dealing with data um, can actually lead to in terms of innovation opportunities and business opportunities. But it's definitely something that needs to be fleshed out quite a lot more. Like this is really, I mean, all this stuff is like, we're at the edges here, yeah? We're at the edges of innovation. We're at the edges of of industry, we're at the edges of in business model innovation in particular. Um, so if there's anyone in the audience that is like into that stuff and want to, wants to work more on it, um, you know, feel free to get in touch with me, absolutely. Another point that is related to this, which was also mentioned in chat, um, is that you, you, um, you mentioned uh, in the slideshow and in, in your presentation that the the overall value of of um of um the mass mass surveillance business model seems to be uh like a bit bit less than three hundred billion dollars, but another another way to measure that value is how much how much um uh, like economic potential is lost if that data becomes unavailable to these companies, which is probably yeah. significantly more than that. Absolutely, I mean I that's uh it's a and it's a super good point. I mean, we can we can go even further than that and say, you know, and look at you know what is the loss to society if that data becomes in, um, unavailable. And you know, here we're talking literally about like the the concentration of of knowledge and knowledge as power in you know pretty much one company in the world right now. It's Google, right? So these things are it's pretty it's pretty major questions. It's pretty serious. And then uh, there's a pretty pretty um uh, like com uh, complex and complicated question. But um, I can't paraphrase it, so I'll just read the whole thing. So, yeah. uh, how could how could we define a non-dualist cultural baseline with fresh narratives of, narratives of uh, of privacy, which could unify solar and lunar punks? Where do you see the biggest frictions in the emerg in the emergent reality of crypto politics? Such a nice question. So you know, in, you know, Nim is very obviously lunar punk, right? But I actually see the I see. Lunar punk and NIM as enabling not just like a solar punk reality, but like like lots of punks <laughs> is the way is the way that I put it. And it's something that we I think like um, we actually need to. If anyone wants to do like a working group on like kind of fleshing out like some new narratives in this space, because I think there's a lot of work to be done here. The lunar punk crews are fantastic. You know, the people who have developed that narrative are fantastic. Um, I think we can go so deep into in that analogy because, you know, and the analogy is a little bit like if we think about lunar punk and solar punk, we can we, we can start we can talk about night and day. Right. And we can talk about the dynamics of night and day, which is not a, a competitive dynamic, but a um, uh, uh, like there's a sit there's a what's it what's it called? There's a balance. Right. So yeah, they're complementary. Right? <laughs> exactly. Because. Um, if anyone here has tried to like not sleep for a few days, then you realize what the what the problem is, right? It's like you actually you need the night in order for the day to 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 happen. You need to sleep in order to be more awake. Um, and it's similarly with privacy and transparency. So um, in order to have transparency, in order to do meaningful things in under the public eye in the world, you absolutely have to have uh, private time. You absolutely have to have rest. You have to have that space, which I f perceive very much as a space where um, it's the kind of a soup of existence where things can actually start to emerge, um, not under force, but but through rest, right? And and that's kind of so the way that I that I kind of uh, intuitively perceive, you know, um, this idea of privacy as the default and having, you know, privacy as as the the foundation of our of our digital communications is literally to put a blanket on a lot of noise, right? Because the noise right now is literally that you know huge industry that is competing for our attention at all times, um, and and it's and they're very good at kind of uh, cloaking that as if it looks like valuable information or important social dynamics or whatever else, but really it's competing it's 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 competition for your mind space. 
Um, so I see the kind of, you know, I see solar punk and lunar punk as absolutely as complementary. Um, but I also, you know, there is a, especially when it comes to kind of zero knowledge proofs. I mean, I can, I wrote a whole essay about this, actually, I'll send it over to you guys. Um, when it comes to like zero knowledge, like this next step in, in uh, the debates around privacy, um, you know, we're looking at zero knowledge proofs and synthetic data. And so it's, it's, uh, it's not just night and day anymore. Um, there's kind of like rainbows that cut across like both <laughs> in a way. Um, and so I think like in terms of narrative work, there is, there is work to be done. And NIM is, NIM is lunar punk, but it's lunar punk in order to enable solar punk. And it's, it's, a uh, it's, um, trying to open up some, some new spaces. So yeah, I would love to kind of do a deep dive on, on kind of, uh, working on some of these questions with you guys. The narrative work group is uh, probably happening according to chat. So, uh, so let's keep an eye on that one. Nice. I'm super interested, interested to see uh, what you guys come up with. Mm -hmm. And th there's another question um, on a global level: How are countries being targeted by uh, the issue of mass surveillance? I'm assuming smaller economies can be threatened easily. Uh, they can be threatened. Well, there's okay. So here we need to kind of. Mm... Uh, yeah, I mean, smaller countries are threatened more easily, but it's it's kind of it's pretty wild out there, right? And it's like we can draw examples from all over the place. And when we talk about kind of targeted surveillance, I mean, we had what was it that case just a couple of years ago where Angela Merkel was under, you know, it realized that the NSA was spying on her. So, like, you know, it's kind of it's it's a problem that um, cuts across uh, countries and, and geopolitics, but it does it in very very different ways, right? Um, and so, like, if you get the, uh, um, hang on one second. Sorry, give me two seconds. We are searching for that. Uh, another thing that came to mind, but I just don't, I, I just can't remember it well enough to summarize it, is the uh, the thing with Catalonia and Spain in recent yeah. history. Do you remember that one? Yeah, exactly. Um, wait, hang on. Mm -mm. Mm. Anyway, uh, basically, to this is to not botch the my answer to that question on late on a Thursday evening. Um, I would rather kind of provide a kind of list of an, an example, uh, so, like examples later on, because there is quite a big difference between so, the way that surveillance hits um, countries in the West and uh, and countries in the global South. Um, I've had quite a lot of long discussions with Andres Arauz, our advisor from the, the was the the, the ex president the, the presidential candidate of Ecuador on exactly some of these issues. Um, so yeah, I'd rather instead of kind of just like botching about, I'd, I'd rather give a give a solid answer in chat later. I can also send you guys once I stop sharing my screen. I can also send you guys uh, a link to one of our uh, recent appearances where where Andres talked about this specifically. How um yeah. how fin financial data is is um by Visa and other companies like like Visa, um is entirely held in the U.S. So that's one one aspect how it's incredibly asymmetrical, um um the the power dynamics of data and how it's held. Anyways, we have we have one more question. Uh, yeah. Are you familiar with Man Manuel Castell's timeless time and space um of flow of flows terms? Yes, absolutely. So I, you know, Manuel Castells, well, first of all, he was the, the, the supervisor of a few friends, PhDs in, in Barcelona. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of a major theorist when I was um, a bit more kind of deep in, in academia. Um, so is that the space of rainbows too? Um, I, think you, I think you're onto something. Um, I think you are onto something. I would like let's let's try and let's work on this a little bit. Um, if we've got solar punk and lunar punk, space of flows feels too abstract between those two. So if we can f think of a way of, um, you know, the way the way that I think about it is that, you know, the space of flows that Manuel Castells described so well, and this was kind of also very much at the time of, um, you know, as the early days of theorizing around the internet and especially how internet changes the nature of space. So if we think about kind of, you know, geographical space, um, 
uh, you know, the space of flows operates quite differently. And Louisa Moore, who I mentioned earlier in the slide deck, also talks about this, um, and it relates also to Salome's understanding of the relational data, of, uh, relational nature of data, is that we're talking about a, a space, a type of space here that is constantly changing, constantly shifting. Um, it expands and contracts, you know, depending on the the the, the processing, the relations that are happening between between um, information flows, um, and it also relates to the this. Uh, this question, you know, if we talk about lunar punk and solar punk and night and day, when we're talking about the digital, there is no night and day, right? <laughs> like, really, there is no night and day. Um, we can kind of create analogies around that and say that, you know, surveillance data is is day and then privacy preserving communications is night, but it's, uh, it is, um, those are metaphors. Um, and so I would like for us to come to Maybe we maybe we can develop some new metaphors that, you know, lunar punk and solar punk is, are very good for making making certain kind of meaning and stories around this question of visibility and invisibility. But I think there's something more going on here, and especially when it comes to data processing, and especially when we move into an era of zero knowledge, where data processing can happen um, regardless of the fact that uh, the data is is invisible, right? The data is 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 not uh, is not made visible. So. Yeah, so I think we can. Um, I think we can do some good work here. You want to participate in the um, in the narratives uh, work uh, workshop? Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. All right, I think that's the end of our questions. Um, actually, there's one more thing mentioned by by Nick, which is a good point. Uh, or, or some interesting uh, piece of info. I know that Visa and MasterCard have departments responsible for finding all possible ways to monetize transactional data. They call it insights, quote unquote. Yeah, exactly. Really great, really great, great name for this uh, for this practice. Yeah. So um, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, when we're talking about we're talking about uh, data driven healthcare or data driven this or data driven that it you know it really is good to keep in the back of your minds like you know to what extent can we, should we really understand this as surveillance and then to what extent is it not right when is the production of data um and the the kind of use of data something that is of societal benefit and i think there's there's still more fine-grained debates that needs to be had about that um at the societal level right so indeed insights is uh, is interesting at some point i think we could we could also, we could also do a whole session on the nature of data um i think that in itself is is a fascinating topic um goes all the way back to to cold war dynamics um so that's for another day <laughs> i mean we still have we still have 11 minutes and that sounds like an absolutely <laughs> fascinating topic so uh, you, you could you could give us the header at least <laughs> um <laughs> well I mean, I've been I've been doing a bunch of reading on on. Well, actually, like it goes even further back than than Cold War dynamics. But you know, when we're talking about the concept, this is this this relates back to a bunch of work that I've done on on the concept of trust in relation to technology and technical systems. Um, so, uh, and it has to do with like the way that we understand knowledge in the first place so data you know has comes from the, the idea of data comes from a kind of history of the objective sciences right and it has and the objective sciences in many ways was a, was you know um based on this kind of this attempt to remove knowledge production to be so reliant on the subjective individual um, and find modes of knowledge production that is that is uh, externally verifiable beyond the individual. Um, and so, uh, and a lot of that, I think, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading through the comments as I'm trying to speak, which is fascinating and distracting at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so so there is this idea of like data being a kind of objective form of knowledge about the world. Um, which then, you know, goes on to becoming, you know, the, this idea of like singularity, what AI being a form of singularity, because it's like if data um, is about mapping more and more objective knowledge about the world, then, you know, the kind of unit that can analyze all that data becomes the kind of main source of all knowledge, right? Um, but when we start looking a little bit more closely at what data actually is, how data is produced, and how it goes on to affect the world, 
um, we, st we start to understand that there is no, you know, there is no static universe, but that can be slowly mapped out by an objective data set. Um, we're living in a constantly changing universe, which doesn't only just change on its own, but it also changes in reaction to the new forms of knowledge and the new forms of data that we're actually producing, right? Um, so in that sense, like there is there that idea of, you know, the kind of scientific process being an incremental mapping of objective knowledge, which will eventually lead to a full picture of, of you know, the universe and how it works. Um, we're kind of past that, you know, and kind of quantum physics took us took us past that. Um, and so, uh, so to kind of then fast forward to the kind of Cold War, <laughs> um, the Cold War was like the, the beginning of algorithms. And again, it was this idea and this attempt to try and create forms of knowledge processing and not just knowledge processing, but acting on knowledge that would be removed from the subjective human because the, the danger here or the fear here was that the subjective human might just press that button, right? So how can we prevent um, uh, you know, human kind of um, fear, you know, ang the anxiety around the kind of human subjective uh, whims and, and desires and whatever else to suddenly kind of put the whole world at risk by blowing off a nuclear uh, bomb. Um, well, let's create decision making processes that are external to the human that are algorithmic. Um, and that can be somehow encoded. And so then you got this kind of match of, you know, this, this, this marriage, let's say, of uh, data and algorithms that then kind of fast forward to today, look the way that they do. Um, but, you know, both are kind of really founded on a misunderstanding of the the relationship between the objective world and, and the subjective um, experience and the subjective form of knowledge production. And so there is that schism in, in the idea of Western science that has led to this idea of uh, mistrustful humans versus, you know, trust trustless or you know trustless systems that we can trust more than the human um you know and we can see how that kind of is very much present in in the blockchain industry and, and the kind of crypto industry um but at the end of the day there is always you know we always come back to the subjective human that is that is part of this process um why because that's actually what we're here for in the first place right so we're building technical systems in order to serve uh, people in order to to advance um, uh, our you know our our well being and and our well being in this planet and so there's a I mean there's a lot more to unpack there and it and it really is something that I could you know carry on <laughs> talking about for for years but I think there we are we're at the precipice of a, a precipice of a of, of a of a new form of theorizing where we no longer have to kind of revert back to a kind of naive understanding of the objective sciences, but can understand objectivity um, in a little bit more of a grounded manner and less through a kind of schizophrenic or a kind of schism between um, the human and the rest of the world uh, that we're tr constantly trying to kind of like um, bridge. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my spiel about how uh, data and the the idea of data and and algorithms goes back to the po to the to the Cold War and and even before then, um, and we can see well, those then, those. Yeah, go ahead. We're, we're definitely doing that talk then. Uh, you're on the hook for that now. <laughs> um, I'm prom I'm promising it in front of everyone so that so that you can get out of it. <laughs> when w, w E N. W E N. A little bit. I think like later in the spring, probably. Um, how can something objective exist if it is created by a subject? Exactly, right? So every time we create, every time we produce, um, but it, you know, it goes even deeper than that. So because you know, it is it it also goes to the core of the question of um, is the subjective located only in the individual human, right? Um, because there is something interesting about the idea of harnessing mathematics and harnessing um, infrastructure in order to create new modes of enactment, but of course. There is always a human at the end of the day that codes, you know, that, that coded the thing in the first place. And that's what the blockchain industry had to learn very quickly, right? So this idea of trustless systems, you know, then you had the kind of big uh, scaling conflict in Bitcoin and, you know, where you had a money system that was supposedly outside of the control of humans. But of course, it's humans that are coding that very, mon that very monetary system. Um, the same thing with, uh, with a DAO hack and so on and so forth. And so, you know, there is... Uh, 
there is a human in the loop all along, but I think even the concept, this idea of the human in the loop is something that, that alludes to the possibility for there to not be a human in the loop, which is a little bit weird when it comes to the production, the creation of, of um, technology. And also when it comes to the question of what are we doing here in the first place? Um, what are we trying to build? And who are we building for in the first place?